With the dawning of the 20th century, for the first time, America held a prominent place on the world stage. The country had become a land of opportunity as millions flooded in from around the globe. Drawn by stories of men who had risen from meager beginnings to build empires. Men like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. entrepreneurs that really have had a significant impact in, in the world take a long-term view. They really think of it in, in terms of decades, not years or, or months. They really believe that in the long run, they're going to have a, a tremendous impact. President William McKinley was re-elected to a second term. And the aspiring trust buster, Theodore Roosevelt, was installed as vice president, a clever ploy to diminish his influence. With McKinley in office for another four years, John Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan had the freedom to expand their empires to unprecedented heights. In September 1901, President McKinley traveled to Buffalo to give a speech celebrating America's prosperity. But that prosperity hadn't reached everyone. Many were still struggling to survive and they were fed up with McKinley's close relationship with big business. Eight days after the attempt on his life, William McKinley succumbed to his injuries and became the third American president to be killed in office. For the country's most powerful men, this was the worst case scenario. An assassin's bullet had robbed them of their president, a man on whom they'd spent millions getting elected. And with his death, their nemesis came to power. Teddy Roosevelt, the man they had tried to silence, was about to become the leader of the free world. Roosevelt quickly launched a campaign against the nation's largest trusts. And his first target was a railroad conglomerate owned by J.P. Morgan. Morgan demanded to see the president, so he stormed down from New York to Washington, went into the White House, and he said, I don't understand. He said, if we've got a problem, send your man to my man and they'll fix it up. And Roosevelt said, this is exactly the problem with Morgan. He acts as though I'm just a rival boss or something. And Morgan, who thought that he could manipulate Roosevelt, discovered that Roosevelt could not be manipulated at all. Roosevelt refused to back down from Morgan he sued his company in federal court, the first government antitrust case filed against a major corporation. Roosevelt went on to win, and Morgan's railroad monopoly was broken up. It was a stunning setback for J.P. Morgan, one that he would agonize over for years. And it was a sign of things to come for his fellow Titans. Roosevelt was soon elected to a second term, and over the course of his administration, he filed suit against dozens of trusts. It was a time of great change for America. 
JP Morgan, John Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie suddenly found themselves as members of an old guard. Aging titans forced to defend their empires. But as other monopolies fell, one target refused to go down. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil had managed to hold off a breakup over a number of administrations. But Rockefeller wouldn't be able to hide forever. Standard Oil got the reputation as the most hated company in America. Um, it became literally the symbol for big business evils. It was an example of big businesses getting way too much power and nothing or no one available to restrain them. The government filed suit against Standard Oil in what promised to be the biggest antitrust case of all time. And the government hoped that their lead witness would be John D. Rockefeller himself. The federal authorities issued a subpoena and Rockefeller went on the run. From California to Maine to Key West, the most powerful man in America had become a fugitive from justice. He went all over the country to escape being served subpoenas. You know, he was constantly running from the law. Rockefeller avoided the subpoenas for months, but life inevitably intervened. His son, John Jr., and his wife welcomed the first Rockefeller grandson into the world. Still on the run from the subpoena, Rockefeller was unable to travel to see his grandchild, and the absence was unbearable. I'm only here for one day. Once I'm gone, I am gone. I may not be back. Rockefeller knew what it was like to be abandoned. Never trust anybody, son. Not even me. And he wasn't going to let this case tear his family apart. He turned himself in, agreeing to testify in court in defense of Standard Oil and in defense of an entire way of business that he had helped create. The case would be the biggest challenge of Rockefeller's life. A fight that would determine the future of the country. As Rockefeller was forced to defend a company he'd built from nothing into one of the most powerful corporations on Earth. By now, everything. By the whole company. United States versus Standard Oil. This hearing is now in session. Please state your name. John Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, can you tell the court how in just one year in 1872, you acquired all the refineries in Cleveland? I don't remember. It was 36 years ago. You used intimidation to wipe out the competition, did you not? I mean, so ruthlessly that it became known as the Cleveland Massacre? I don't remember any massacre. 
Are you aware of payments made by Standard Oil to a senator $15,000 to block a bill hostile to Standard Oil? I don't remember. We have a list of bribes made by Standard Oil to politicians between 1902. I stepped down as chief executive of Standard Oil in 1902. I can't answer for any incidents that occurred after that date. You are still president of Standard Oil, are you not? It's an honorary title, much like that of president of the United States. Can I remind you, Mr. Rockefeller, of the seriousness of the charges brought against you? As John Rockefeller fought to keep his monopoly intact, a new generation of businessmen were facing a new set of challenges as they struggled to get their companies off the ground. I have set out to build the best motor car for popular use. The Ford motor car is durable and light, weighing only 1,000 pounds. It has a four-cylinder engine and is capable of speeds up to 45 miles an hour. It is priced at $900 compared to $1,500 for the average licensed car, which makes it the first car affordable for the common man. The young entrepreneur Henry Ford had created a new kind of car, but in order to sell it, he needed to get permission from the Association of Licensed Automobile Manufacturers, also known as Alum. Alum owned the patent on the automobile, giving them complete control over who could manufacture and sell cars. They were, in a sense, a giant car monopoly. And Ford's future now rested in their hands. Thank you, Mr. Ford. We'll be in touch. Thank you, gentlemen. Ford was hopeful that he would be approved by Alum, allowing him to start his own business and to pursue his dream for the future of the car industry. When Ford entered the automobile business, people didn't drive their own cars. They had drivers. And so cars were seen as this luxury item. Ford's insight was that cars could be an everyday item. They could be very utilitarian. So that it was within the reach of ordinary people. Ford had spent years developing his car for the common man. He built his first model at the age of 33 and called it the Quadricycle. But the vehicle was expensive to produce and prone to breaking down. Ford's second attempt, the Model A, was much more suited to the needs of modern America. But he couldn't begin selling it without Alum's permission. Alan was successful in blackmailing other automobile companies, saying, you have to be licensed by us or we will sue you, and we own this patent. After months of deliberation, the Allen board reached its decision. Henry Ford's application was rejected. It was a crushing blow. The cartel had stopped him in his tracks. But Henry Ford was determined to show the world that to succeed in America, all you needed was integrity and ingenuity.